Welcome to AZ TechCast, sponsored by the Arizona Technology Council, with your hosts, Steve Zylstra and Karen Nowitz. AZ TechCast is dedicated to covering innovation and technology in Arizona and beyond. Broadcasted monthly, AZ TechCast invites leading experts to have real conversations about what is happening in the tech sector across the state of Arizona. From regional news to innovative startups, companies, and emerging technologies, AZ TechCast covers the critical issues and economic trends propelling the state's growing tech ecosystem. Hello and welcome. We are looking forward to this conversation today. In this episode of AZ TechCast, we dive into the dynamic intersection of artificial intelligence and marketing as AI continues to evolve. Marketers face both exciting opportunities and daunting challenges. We explore advances in AI technology from enhanced predictive analytics to hyper-personalized content generation. However, amidst, amidst these advancements, the specter of copyright infringement looms large, raising critical questions about the ethical use of generative, generative AI tools. Marketers must navigate the complex terrain of protecting intellectual property while harnessing the potential of AI-driven creativity. I'm Karen Nowicki, president and owner of Phoenix Business Radio X, and I'd like to welcome you to the AZ TechCast, sponsored by Arizona Technology Council. AZ TechCast is dedicated to covering innovation and technology in Arizona and beyond. So please help me in giving a warm welcome to today's featured guest. We have Stephen Caradini, assistant professor of technical communication at Arizona State University. Welcome to the studio. Thank you. Happy Absolutely. to be here. Happy to have you. And we have Renee Yeager also in the studio with us today. She is the CEO and co-founder of Yeager Marketing. Welcome, Renee. Thank you, Karen. Absolutely. And I might as well go right to Steve next since he's in the studio as well. Steve Zalstra, who is our representation of AZ TechCast and everything as far as Arizona Technology Council goes. Thanks for being here. Absolutely. My, my partner here. in crime always when we do these, if Leslie's not standing in for one of us. And then with us remotely is uh, Spencer Lee. He's the digital marketing and AI Enablement Specialist, love that title, with Intero Digital. Welcome, Spencer. Thank you. Thank you for having us. So thrilled to have each of you. These accomplished experts, along with Steve and I, are going to be discussing lessons learned in leadership. We have a lot of interesting content to cover, so let's dive in as it relates to marketing and AI. I'd like to start by having each of you share a little bit about yourself and you know, introduce yourself, the role that you play in your organization, and how that feeds into Arizona's tech ecosystem. Uh, let's see. Renee, would you be willing to start first? Sure, of course. Hi, my name is Renee Yeager. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Yeager Marketing. We are a marketing communications agency that works uniquely with the tech sector. So we work with uh, technology companies from very large enterprise, names that you would know, through to the mid-market, down to startups, um, supporting them on everything from strategy development, market research, content creation campaigns. Um, I've had this agency with my husband since 2009. Um, we've grown it substantially here in Arizona. We're based in Scottsdale. Um, personally, I've lived in the Valley for 28 years, um, originally from the East Coast, but very happy to be here and avoid some of those winters. So <laughs> thank you. And Karen. by the way, a very important partner of ours in producing our quarterly magazine, Tech Connect. Oh, I did not know that. Yes. Good to know. You were very humble when we had our pre-show call. You didn't tell us that. Oh, yeah, thank you, Stephen. <laughs> I love it. Yes. And how about you, Stephen? Uh, yeah, I'm Stephen Caradini. I'm an assistant professor of technical communication. My specialty areas are uh, social media in the workplace and um, digital ethics. And then my research is focused on the implementation of emerging technologies in workplaces, broadly conceived, everything from micro businesses to uh, Fortune 500 companies. So I've studied everything from smartphones to Facebook to Kickstarter, and now I've been focusing on artificial intelligence for the last four or five years. Never a, a boring moment for you with how quickly things change, I would imagine. Yeah, no, emerging technologies is uh, always emerging. And so I, I end up in a lot of unusual conversations, certainly. Um, and so it's a it's a fast paced position, which is especially fun because I'm teaching students 
for these emerging technologies and they're they're always excited to be having these cutting edge conversations and having things where I can genuinely say, hey, I learned this 10 minutes ago. Let's talk about it. <laughs> right. So. By the way, Stephen is also a major contributor to uh, our annual public policy guide and some key policy areas that he's an expert in. Oh, fantastic. Well, I can see why you guys thought to include our panelists so far. So let's bring Spencer to the conversation. And Spencer, we'd love to have a chance to meet and get to know you as well. Thanks. My name is Spencer Lee. Uh, been in marketing for a very long time. That's where all the gray hair comes from. Uh, I don't mind it. I get a little bit of instant credibility out of that. Um, got my start in email marketing back in the Wild West days when you could sort of do anything you wanted to. And uh, the changes that we've seen between now and then is tremendous. So before this, I actually owned a, an email company with uh, offices in, in several countries. We were sending about a billion emails a month. So there's a chance that we were You've probably received an email from myself or one of my. Oh clients. yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Um, right now with Intero Digital, uh, I've been specializing in uh, AI data enablement as well as uh, running the email marketing department and um, enterprise paid media. That, this is a silly question. We could probably have a whole episode dedicated to this. Please tell me that email is still relevant. I know the answer to that question, but it yeah. is relevant, isn't it? more relevant than ever i yeah, gathered as much relevant. yeah so we'll it's double opt in you opt in to get it you opt in to open it so if they even open it you're in a very very good space mm -hmm. yeah. okay i'm sure i would love for you to bring that into our conversation today because i'm sure that ai plays a role there as well before mm -hmm. we jump into today's conversation though i would love for steve for you to have an opportunity to tell us a little bit about yourself of course and then arizona technology council well uh Steve Zylster, President and CEO of the Arizona Tech Council. I've been doing that job now for 16 years. Prior to that, uh, I ran the Pittsburgh Technology Council for seven. And prior to that, I was in the aerospace and defense industry for 20 years as an engineer and then an executive. Um, Tech Council is a statewide organization, offices in Phoenix and Tucson. We are uh, a uh, tech-based, science-based trade association. Um, focused on enterprise, uh, as well as our academic friends and some cities and towns and so on that are all interested in the growth of technology in Arizona. We do public policy advocacy at the state and federal level. Uh, we do over 100 events a year. Uh, we publish a lot of reports. We do actually two podcasts. Uh, and we negotiate lower cost products and services on behalf of our members. So a uh, pretty traditional uh, trade association business model, but focused on science and technology-based enterprises. I've never thought to ask you this question before, but having been an engineer and then making this transition all those years ago, uh, personality-wise, if I'm even allowed to ask that question, was there a big shift for you? Because you're such a great speaker and really a connector. Every time you're here with us, I feel like I'm the most important person here when it's just you and I. And I know our panelists feel that way when we're in conversation. Was that a big leap for you or how had you throughout your whole career found yourself moving in that direction where you're you're just you have this beautiful flow about you? Yeah, pretty much since day one. Um, you know, my first job was actually at the Ford Motor Company and I was in their graduate management training program, which is a two year program where you do stents all over the company. And um, uh, after that, I went into aerospace and I always sort of um, uh, moved toward the management roles, the leadership roles, and so on. So, you know, while I have a, a, a deep technology background, I sort of bubbled up to the top. Yep, yep. And you're a people person for sure. So, okay. I'm, I'm on these little tangents today. I'm not sure why. And I'm attempting, for those of us watching on LinkedIn or eventually on one of our websites, I have been attempting to try to run the production and be on camera too. But I keep going to a different camera that doesn't have everybody in the screenshot. So if I just land in the conversation and forget to show my, my smiling face, know that I'm knee deep in the conversation and don't want to be a, a distraction. So on that note, let's move to our first First question, what are some of the biggest changes that you've seen in digital marketing? And now that generative AI has been released into the wild, what's beginning to change and take place now? Uh, that's uh, something that we all need to be aware of. Okay, I'll jump in. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think with the, and I guess, Karen, over what time period would be a question because... Maybe the last two years oh yeah okay well 
Um, I would say that the increasing amount of data collection um, that we're gathering um, has been a factor um, in terms of our ability as marketers. We want to understand our customers as much as possible, um, get in their hearts and minds, if you will. Um, and we do that through data collection. Um, there's also more concerns in the last few years around uh, the impact of that data collection and data privacy issues and data security issues. So I would say those things go hand in hand, but are both um, impacting how we as marketers um, deal with data, collect data, um, are clear about that data collection, how we use the data. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yep. I would say there's also been tremendous changes in the actionable items that generative AI has given us to act on that data, right? The, the many ways in which we can personalize campaigns and take action based on the analytics that we gather from the data is uh, it's grown exponentially. It, it's almost, uh, it's a daunting thing to try and keep up with as a marketing agency, but the, the power that it brings is undeniable. So now it's a question of, you know, now that we can do all of these things, should we? <laughs> I just had a superhero and a metaphor, and I've never thought about that as it relates to AI, but the way that you worded that, like with great strength comes responsibility or however that saying goes. Great I think power comes great responsibility, like Spider-Man. <laughs> right, <Yeah. laughs> Spider-Man specifically, right? <laughs> Anything to add to that, Steven? Yeah, I think that there's been a increased scrutiny on social media platforms in particular over the past uh, two years, especially over the past six months. And while AI plays into that indirectly, I think some of the things that I'm seeing coming are a, uh, a challenge to even implement AI um, in some places as uh, the scrutiny on social media to some extent delimits the ability to introduce new features and have people trust them and believe in them. Um, and I think that there's a, uh, a change to some extent, to what extent we don't, I don't know yet. There's a change to some extent in how uh, people interact with ads and marketing online as they move from traditionally text and image based platforms like Facebook and Instagram into video based, uh, platforms like TikTok and Reels and things like this. It's just different ways of reaching them, but that also produces data, like you were saying, in very different ways. Video has very different data associated with it than the traditional Facebook ad or boosted post. And so I think the the rise of, of video, which intersects to some extent with the way that AI is um, is building, is one of the things I see the most. I'm, I'm assuming you've all seen um, the uh, New York Times lawsuit uh, around copywriting. Um, mm -hmm. Generative AI tools are using copyrighted material uh, mm -hmm. at training data. It's a big issue for those trying to protect their work, of course. Uh, what, are, what should marketers be thinking about in relation to protecting uh, their creative work? Yeah, and I think um using OpenAI and seeing the power that it has and what it's able to create. Um, always keeping in the back of your mind that this is not your work. <laughs> um, you know, we need to leverage these tools to help guide our content creation. Um, but it looks very easy and that's where these, you know, playground, um, uh, plagiarism and copyright infringement things come up. People take it and they use it as fact. Um, there's also bigger concerns there where, you know, OpenAI and other tools like that are pulling from the internet. They're pulling from things that exist in mm -hmm. public that may or may not be fact. Mm -hmm. They may be slanted, right, or have bias attached to them. And those are all considerations, right? So for us in, in my world as an agency, we are creating content for clients and very much attuned to the risks there. Like, mm -hmm. I, I mean, it's just original authorship matters, will continue to matter, even though everyone's mm -hmm. talking about, well, we can just use AI to create all of our content. Mm -hmm. I just don't see that as reality um, because of these issues like this. And Stephen, you have this um, policy spin on the things that you do. This, yeah. this is a really good question for you. Yeah, the, the development of, of generative AI went way faster than people were ready to respond with 
even from the creators themselves with some of the policy considerations that are happening. And even the technical considerations didn't get full thought. So one of the things that I tell my students, I tell people when I'm talking about this, is that anything you put into a, a chat box, open AI, any sort of, of large language model transformer, that data is going to be kept and used as part of the model going forward. So if you put in um, your, your client's content, like you've just released their copyright because if that data is then regenerated, which we know that it can be reproduced by asking very specific questions, everything that comes out of a transformer out of a large language model like OpenAI is not copyrightable. So if you accidentally put in your client's data and then it's reproduced later, you've just released their copyright mm -hmm. entirely and then you can take that and do what you want with it. That is not what you want to happen as, a, as an agency, <laughs> right? You don't want to be the person that accidentally releases a copyright. So right. it's, it's very challenging to go through some of these tools and use them in a work for hire context because the content that you'd like to, to generate off of is, is really risky. Now there are ways around this. You can use things like walled gardens where uh, you have usually an enterprise model, ChatGPT enterprise does this, where they say like, we're not gonna touch your data. It just stays inside this box. And like, you can use open AI, but it won't, our data won't go in there. Uh, we won't go in there, the data won't come out. So there are ways around this that we're starting to develop and we're starting to experiment with, Arizona State is experimenting with a walled garden with open AI. Other industries are doing it as well, other companies and industries. So there are ways around these problems, but essentially, the the policies didn't exist really they still don't exist and so it, there's a lot that has to be done to protect yourself and the the baseline is don't put anything into a chat bot that you're you're not willing to see come out on the other end for somebody else yeah, that, that, that really does need to be a, a series of non-negotiables i think within the company so the the way we think about it is there's two ways of approaching this there's uh, the safeguards that are put into place on the tool side we have companies like Stability AI, and I think I believe Anthropic actually has data opt-outs that are available. Um, you know, if you're a content creator, a content owner, um, and then there's a, as Steve brought up the the walled garden effect, the GPT Enterprise. We've been using that for quite a while now. We're we're an early adopter, mm -hmm. um, but there's also a cultural component within your company that needs to be put into place, which is, you know, uh, and I'll, I'm speaking to this from the context of a digital market ag agency, but as a, an expert marketer your experience and your knowledge of what a good output is, is the most important component of what it is that you're presenting to a client. So yeah. the quality assurance piece needs to be there just as the culture of, you know, not exposing proprietary data and and not relying solely on the output of the, the transformer to, you know, pass off as your own client work. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, a, a lot of what we just discussed are le legal implications, right? Yeah. Copyrights are legal. Mm -hmm. Uh, what about some of the ethical uh, issues and challenges that we're facing in uh, digital marketing uh, as a result of AI? I think the big one is responsibility for the words that you're putting out. Um, and this actually has become more prominent in the last week. Um, Air Canada recently just lost a uh, a small claims court battle, but a court battle nonetheless, where uh, Air Canada had gone all in on a chat bot to help with customer service, which is not exactly marketing, but it relates in a way that we're going to get to. And the chat bot gave poor information about a bereavement policy. And when the, um, the plaintiff went to do the policy, the company said, no, like, that's not the policy. And he said, well, your bot told me it was. And Air Canada said, well, that's a separate legal entity that we're not responsible for. And he said, well, I think we're gonna go to court and find that out. And the judge said, no, that is not a separate legal entity. If you made a bot for Air Canada, then right. you're responsible for that. And so uh, they lost and they had to do some financial remuneration, um, not full remuneration. And they got some hand slapping on, you should have marked that this might give incorrect answers. Um, so don't trust it fully, which diminishes its value as a customer service bot. But so that might be why they didn't put that on there. And then they shut Air Canada shut down the bot. So the the value here for marketers is that if you do have something that comes up where your client or your company says, hey, like 
this is wrong. And you say, ah, the bot did it, not me. Like, you're still going to be responsible for that yeah. legally and ethically. Like, you really have to internalize that whatever this tool makes is still not A, your work exactly, because it is generated, like you yeah. were saying, but yeah. B, you are responsible for that in a way that I think we're often not thinking about as much. That's really fascinating. So how did the bot come up with the wrong information? Do they know? I I don't know exactly. I have guesses, but um, in reading through the very brief claim of and and a legal document of the small claims court, I, I, I wasn't able to to say definitively, but I would I would wager that if they trained it on a, a database bigger than just the policies of Air Canada itself, it may have found a separate bereavement policy somewhere else right. or some words attached to the word bereavement mm -hmm, right. and put them together because statistically those were likely. And then there you are. So it's, and it it's not, even that hard to get to that sort of problem if oh. you have a big enough training data set. And so, no, I don't know the exact reasons that happened. Um, I'm sure this happened like five days ago. So I'm sure we'll find out more and more over the, the next few weeks and, and how, um, unless Air Canada never talks about it again. <laughs> yeah. might be the if they wiped away the bot, it's a possibility. Yeah. I mean, it's shut, it, it was shut down. I don't know if it'll come back up. These things are fluid, but. Other thoughts on, ethical considerations and challenges in the digital marketing world? Yeah, I think that, you know, we need to think about how AI is transforming not only our work processes within uh, us as business owners and, and agencies, but also how it's changing the consumer, right? The, the consumer is expecting more and more personalized content. But if you look at the stickiness of someplace like Spotify, right? I used to mail for Spotify way, way back in the day. The reason most people don't leave Spotify for other services is because of how good the recommendation algorithms are. It's one of the reasons we're still on Netflix, because it got pretty good at understanding what it is that you'd like to watch. And that type of personalization uh, is, is just going to become more and more sticky for brands as, as we move forward, you know, especially over the next year or two. So the, the consumer is changing. Their expectations are getting uh, higher. And you know, the, the ethical commitment to be able to supply accuracy, uh, consistency, and, um, you know, the, the, the right type of recommendations in marketing is, is just going to become more and more onerous over the next couple of years. I would add to that, too, that, interestingly enough, I don't know that people always understand that the recommendations that are being presented to them are based on their behaviors. Yeah. And I, I mean, it sounds crazy to say it, but I think it's true. And oh, no, it's true. It's brand, true. Brands have a responsibility to educate their audiences on the data collection piece. Yeah. This is what we're collecting from you. This is why we're collecting from you. And on the consumer side, they have to make a decision on whether or not they're comfortable with that or not. Mm -hmm. And are, is there any, uh, is it the wild, wild west when it comes to having to disclose that kind of thing? Or are there some regulations in place right now that say you must state these things. I, I don't know that I've seen anything like that. Well, so there are potential cases. So I don't know of any data disclosure law that specifically relates to Arizona. So there, I don't know of any federal law um, and I don't know of any Arizona state law, but I do know that there are laws in California. Um, there's um, commercial protection laws in California. And then, of course, there's the GDPR and associated EU uh, laws and new laws come in from the EU frequently, um, at least in comparison to American policy on the issue. So um, the Brussels effect is the idea that whatever the EU gets um, put down on paper, everybody else follows just because it's easier to do it one way than to do it every other way. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, the GDPR and the new Digital Markets Act are related to it in terms of what you have to do. But I, I couldn't put my finger on a specific policy about the, uh, the, the scope of data collection needing to be addressed in a specific way. The these laws are coming, though. I, I was just going to ask yeah. that. How um, soon so, do we think that's um, happening? I had my public policy committee meeting this morning, and um, we have an AI committee, too. And in the mm -hmm. AI committee, we have an AI public policy group. And yes. um, 
there are five bills, AI bills going to the state legislature as we speak. So mm -hmm. we have our AI policy committee, you know, reviewing all those bills to determine whether the tech council is going to support them, oppose them or be neutral on them. So, mm -hmm. it, you know, it's coming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm on that committee, that AI subcommittee, and yeah. it's, yeah, there there are bills that are coming. It's unclear what appetite there is to do meaningful bills in AI at the federal level right. um, because they're very invested in social media bills right now, which is where I work originally and, and still teach. And so my students this semester have been on a roller coaster of like, well, here comes a bill. Oh, there it goes. Oh, oh, come another one. So, uh, so the the energy in policy in the federal space right now, while there are lots of small AI bills um, going through, um, lots of mandates for different departments to use it in various ways and tell the government and the public how this being used. I don't see any big ones on the horizon right now that are gaining a lot of traction, um, but in the the state level. Um, and not just our state level, but lots of other state levels, I see more traction for bills that relate to AI and to data collection. That's my understanding too. I think there are five or seven states that have um, bills that are similar to the CCPA, yeah. California yeah. legislation. Um, so maybe being handled at the state level right now. now how yeah. do you feel about the speed of legislation versus the speed of innovation? Do you feel that legislation can ever keep up with how fast the space is moving? No, no, and no. I, I don't think it should try either, um, because I think if you you put yourself too far ahead of the of the innovation, then you start legislating the wrong things. Um, if you put yourself too far behind the legislation, then or behind the innovation, then you're not really going to have any actionable work. But everything will already be done by the time you tell people what they can and can't do. And so I think you have to trail a little behind the innovation. Otherwise, you you are on either side of the problem not being productive. I think there has to be a conversation between the companies and uh, and the, the policymakers. And unfortunately, over the past five, six, seven, eight years in the social media space in particular, that conversation has broken down in sort of dramatic ways. Mm -hmm. And I'm hopeful that in the AI space, there's already been some indication that that the AI um, companies are are more willing to interact with policymakers. What that will be like and what it will mean is still unclear. But I'm hopeful that there will be less breakdown of communication and therefore more speedy policy. I, I would just add, at the federal level, um, lawmakers worry about stifling innovation with regulation, mm -hmm. uh, particularly because of uh, all the bad actors out there who are not going to be regulated. And, um, you know, we want to be at the leading edge of innovation and regulation can sometimes be very stifling. Exactly. It can also, if, yeah, it can be stifling in a lot of ways. Um, but we also, one of the American regulatory principle is that if somebody gets hurt, then we'll make a law about it. And the mm -hmm. European regulatory principle is if uh, somebody might get hurt, let's stop that before it's, before it happens. And so we bounce back and forth between these polls um, because uh, no one can be there on the spot, like right when it's happening and stick your hand in front of the ball. Right. So you have to pick which which end you're going to be on even a little bit. Um, and so I think the American concept is is primarily wait and see um, both at the state and federal levels whereas the european regulatory principle has been more uh potentially proactive and especially on ai um, they've been moving much faster than the united states on ai principles for law um, for the eu so i think there's uh w one of the 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 problems of innovation and legislation is that that balance is is always really hard to strike so that you have a minimum of people get hurt. Like copyright seems like a thing that we should be working on aggressively so that all of the people, I mean, I think every person's room probably owns a copyright or five, right? Yeah. So we should be working on that. But at the same time, like if we had established a copyright law 10 years ago for AI, then none of this would have happened. So mm -hmm. it's a balance. Renee, what does um, all of this mean for the consumer, do you think? Um, 
I think there are trade-offs that we have to decide if we're comfortable with or not um, in terms of giving up um, access to our behavioral data, that privacy of, in terms of how we operate as human beings to get the wonderful conveniences of being served up things that matter to us and have relevant marketing pushed our way. There's a price for that though. Um, and I don't know how people feel about it. And generationally, it's interesting. You know, I think younger generations, I have a college age son. I don't think he thinks for a minute about how his data is being used. Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, then I hear on the flip side that people are a little more um, protective of theirs. So I'm curious as a college professor, um, Stephen, if you have thoughts on that. Yeah, I think it's variable. Uh, I think my students who are usually juniors and seniors and in a course or a major uh, concentration about social media are a little bit more aware than, than most. Um, I do think that there's a sense where if there's too much personalization, they start to think it's creepy. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's a, there's sort of this qualitative unspecific line that they're like, yeah, that's too much though. Right. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so I think there is a, a sense in which they have this sort of fish in water sort of sense of how privacy works, mm -hmm. but they don't have a sort of explicit principle that many of them at least don't have an explicit principle that they're applying to their data until something goes wrong, right? right. If someone's been bullied or if some someone has been um, in a situation like stalking or something, something has gone wrong, then people are very aware and people around them are very aware and like, you know, so, so I think there's, it's, it's, there is a general sense more often than, um, especially 10 years ago, but um, I, it's, it's not super clear. Spencer, thoughts? Yeah. So my, I have a 15 year old son and it's really odd because in the last year or so, uh, him and his, his peer groups have sort of been pulling back from technology a bit. They've been a little bit more aware of, you know, how they're being uh, presented with all this information based on their behavior. And I think there's a small amount of rebellion. I, I don't know how long it's going to last, but it's observable. Hopefully, hopefully it will last. <laughs> Before yeah. we go on to the next set of questions, I would love for us to take a moment to give a shout out to one of our sponsors, and that's Arizona Commerce Authority. We couldn't do this program without their support. Let's listen for, uh, for a message from them for just a moment. Our streamlined pro-business approach helps you achieve more by putting less between you and future success. Less red tape, lower taxes, less distance separating you from the tech leaders of tomorrow. This innovative ecosystem will supply your business with tools and resources to compete in the 21st century and beyond. But your future is more than just business success. In Arizona, the lifestyle you want is at your fingertips. Explore cities known for their Southwest heritage and modern vision. Enjoy beautiful scenery and endless outdoor activities on land, water, or snow. And if you're looking for a little friendly competition, we've got plenty of teams to choose from. With constant sunshine, vibrant culture, and natural wonder, Arizona provides a style of living that's entirely unique. People from all over the world call our state home. From student leaders who fill the classrooms of our top-ranked universities to a skilled and abundant workforce that's ready for what's next. To the neighbors, friends, and peers we interact with daily, Arizonans are united by a pioneering spirit that moves us forward. So as you look to the future, know that it's filled with the perfect balance of innovation and high-quality living that makes life better here. You might have heard me giggle when they said ASU because Steven's in here pumping it up. <laughs> I love it. Well, we're always appreciative of Arizona Commerce Authority. They are this year's AZ TechCast 2024 premier sponsor. All right, let's talk about... Well, I've been hogging the mic, so... I don't I'm, know that you have. 
you always feel that way. And I'm like, keep taking it, <laughs> keep taking it. I got my hands full over here. Uh, let's go to the next question that we thought would be great for our conversation today for our listeners and viewers. And that is, what are some of the best practices for using generative, generative AI as it relates to marketing communication? And I can't help but think that the email conversation might sneak its way back in here. Yes. Uh, <laughs> best practices as far as creating campaigns is to never trust an output, right? You need to take the output as a guide and, and massage it into something that, uh, that is usable and that's guided by your expertise, your experience, and your knowledge of what's correct. Um, now, on the company side, what that means is that you need to make a policy and a means of checking to make sure that this sort of thing is happening within your agency. So we, we have a, a series of non-negotiables, right? And some of those non-negotiables non involve never copying and pasting directly an output because A, it's a violation of ethics and B, uh, it's not going to be any good. Not yet. In a year, maybe, right? But today is not that day. Um, some of the other best practices are, are absolutely, you know, never expose your client's data uh, to an open model, right? Even if you're using something that's running locally on a machine, uh, you never want to expose proprietary information, financials, patents, um, schedules, product releases, uh, legal documents, anything like that it needs to be 100% siloed. Now, with, with GPT-4 Enterprise, we're, we're kind of in a unique situation because it is SOC 2 compliant. Your data is siloed. And, uh, you know, we do trust so far that, that there hasn't been any major breach. But, um, yeah, definitely. Those are the two big non-negotiables right off the bat. Renee? Yeah, I mean, how we're using it is more from a, um, a research perspective right now. Um, it's great for that. It goes through lots of information on the web. It can cut research time down dramatically. But the human element matters here, right? We have to go through it. We have to vet it, validate it, make sure it's going to work for us. Um, so again, it is a tool um, for us to use. It's not... Um, I know there's a lot of fear around it replacing jobs and with all the tech layoffs, I think automation and things like AI are concerning to marketers in general. Um, but in my experience and what I'm seeing, I don't think the human element is going away anytime soon, nor should it. It's a partner, right? For exactly. all of us um, working alongside us, one of the smartest partners you ever work with in your life, right? <laughs> Anything to add to that in terms of best practices? Uh, yeah, I think that wherever you're applying AI, it should be related to what your ongoing best practices are. So if you have practices about micro-targeting and the scale and scope of what you're going to do for ads, um, this many parameters, not this many parameters, mm -hmm. et cetera, then you should make sure that your AI sticks to that too um, and not just set your AI on it and go on because it's it's easy to have principles that we've built through the actual interaction of doing the marketing, doing the work, doing the client building, and then have a tool that hasn't done any of that. And you just, it, it's easy to assume that it will do the same things that you would do, but it doesn't do that. And so uh, making sure that it is, like you were saying, Spencer, fitting with company policy and making checklists and finding ways to, to make sure that it's doing what you think it's doing. I think that's hugely important because it is very easy to, uh, push a button in an email client and think one thing is going to happen and then it does and then push a button in a, a LLM and think one thing is going to happen and then it doesn't, but you don't know that. Yep. Yep. This is a subtly different question. Um, so to me, the benefits I personally get from AI is I do a lot of speeches. I write a lot of articles and it is so efficient at really you know creating the baseline for you right mm -hmm. that yep. then you can add value to and um, pulls all the data for you which you have to check and, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth but what are some of the benefits uh, that marketers derive from using all these ai tools it solves the blank sheet of paper problem yes <laughs> yes. yes writer's yes. block <laughs> yeah that's a great way to phrase yeah. it yeah, and, and that's really how I use it too. I have too. I, it's been huge for me 
in what we do on behalf of our clients here at Business Radio X. It's a perfect way to word it, Spencer, getting rid of that 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 sticking point or that launching off point yeah. and starting from, from that point forward with that responsibility, of course, to make sure that the information that I'm asking it for and that I'm receiving uh, that I'm taking responsibility for it. Sure. And one of the analogies that, that we use when we're talking to people about, you know, how to use generative AI in your work is uh, that is it easier to sit down and, and come up with, you know, 50 different ideas for a campaign? Or is it easier to go into a meeting with some of the smartest people you know, and then have everybody throw ideas together, and then you piece together what makes the most sense from all those ideas? What's easiest? Right. You know, is it to it's a cut down from a large amount of data or is it to generate, you know, brand new data from scratch? You know, what's what's going to be the best use of your time and where are you going to get the best work product? Yeah, I agree 100 percent with that. The ideation process, it's huge mm -hmm. for that yep. time saver um, and just the uh, expanded perspective that it brings um, to even in a small office. You know, it, it really, to Steve's point, adds that extra person to your team or team of people to your team. Yeah. It's, it's a really, it's the smartest, dumbest intern you'll ever have <laughs> that you don't have to include in the coffee run. Right. <laughs> or, or payroll. Right. <laughs> really. Exactly. I mean, not in a heavy way. Yeah. And yeah. it doesn't get a vote. Ah, right. How, yeah. How is AI impacting the overall efficiency in, in the marketing realm and particularly in digital marketing? Because, you know, it, it, it from a process standpoint, really. Now you're now now you're talking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's the efficiencies that that are coming out of the use of AI, not only in data analysis and in creating action action plans from that that data, but also the speed at which content can be created and curated for for the number of clients. The the amount of labor that that we save is almost incalculable at this point. Right when we first started tallying it up, I think the rough estimate was that since just a, uh, January of last year, we saved somewhere around half a million dollars in labor, and I, I have a feeling that number is actually a lot smaller. Right, that's a very conservative estimate. Um, but the number of clients that an you know an agency can actively handle at a time increases greatly if you're doing this correctly. Um, the work output gets better. Your employee stress goes down. Uh, and the clients are overall happier, right? That's the kind of the dream formula. And that's if you're using AI to remove uh, from the day-to-day -day life the, uh, that you lead at your company, the, the menial, the, re the repetitive, the things that you don't like to do, then you get to focus more on the parts of the job you do like, which is, you know, for some people, it's the creative bits. For some people, it is the data analysis, um, you know, but the, the ability to gather that data, report on the data, act on the data, and you know, spend more time doing the things that uh, marketing experts are paid to do. Uh, you just, it's a, it's a winning formula all the way around. This technology was made for our industry. Yeah. Stephen, anything to add to that? I, I think that's true. And I think that the, the use case that you, you pointed out really works when you're doing exactly what you're doing, which is expanding the number of clients you can take on. Right. So if you have, uh, a that's a, a direct value add, right? Like we have the same amount of people, but we can do more work and we can do it in a more sustainable and healthy way. It's like the ideal format for any implementing technology is that the the employees see the benefit, the managers see the benefit, and the the client or the output sees the benefit. So if everybody sees this is working for us in a virtuous triangle, then that's that's where the ideal implementation strategy lives. And so I think that um, that's great. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. From, from a business owner perspective and even an agency perspective, what are the biggest advantages when you look at it maybe selfishly from from that place? Is it is it the same conversation? Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, for me anyway, I think the ability to automate um, jobs that can move talent into more challenging opportunistic roles is really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I will say that I feel like there is a learning curve here to get the most out of the technology. Absolutely. 
And, you know, it isn't, and, you know, always, I think in, in many ways it is an easy button, but it isn't always an easy button. Mm -hmm. Knowing those right prompts to ask, mm -hmm. knowing how to go about um, asking the right questions to get the right input and then being able to, um, you know, ideate through that is a skill. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the jobs will change um, mm -hmm. in marketing in the coming years, just the nature of the roles. Um, but they may end up being more strategic, higher level roles because we're going to be able to automate a lot of this um, lower level activity that we've been spending a lot of time on. And I also think it goes to whatever the, the value of the specific organization is, right? Like if your, your marketing agency says we work with really complex and difficult projects, then you may not automate that much because the whole point is that you're working with complex and difficult projects. If you're working with uh, small businesses that have uh, small budgets and are working to get off the ground, then you may be able to take on more clients and, and work in a more efficient way. Um, so I think, I think where the efficiencies for any business lie are in how can it serve the, the baseline value proposition of your business and how can you use that to have your employees be even more effective at that thing that you're doing. So instead of saying that it has these superpowers, it's the, the ability of this really powerful tool um, to work hand in hand with your, your employees and you to build your business's value proposition outward. I, I want to um, also emphasize something you said and that Renee, that we're really in our infancy here, right? Yeah. And, you get the impression from the popular media that everybody's using AI for everything, right? <laughs> it's not the case. Mm -hmm. It's a yeah. very tiny percentage of people who are actually effectively beginning to use these tools in the whatever kind of business uh, it is. So, um, you know, we all have a ton to learn yet. And, totally. and not only that, the tool keeps uh, changing and, yeah. and improving, <laughs> yes. uh, right, on a, on a regular basis. Yeah. So. Uh, we have to learn uh, new things as we go on too. So anything to add to that discussion, Spencer? Yeah, actually, Renee, that's a really good point in uh, how our marketing jobs are going to change, right? Because if, if you just think about us as people, think about you having a, a, you know, a fight to the death against you without your phone, <laughs> right? Who's going to win? Like it, it makes my blood run cold thinking about trying to take me on myself on without my phone um you're so much smarter you're so much faster you're so much more capable um so yeah i couldn't agree with you more the the tools are changing how we're going to do our jobs the jobs themselves may change clients expectations certainly are going to change mm -hmm. consumers already changing so let's talk a little bit about the downside um you know, what are some of the pitfalls? Uh, what are things marketers uh, need to be careful of? How uh, can using AI in your business uh, allow you to go off the rails? Yeah, I mean, to your point earlier, um, you're right that people are dipping their toe in the water here. And I think part of the reason for that was because the tools were not readily available or cost effective for everyone to be able to leverage them. But now, there are more tools and it's becoming more accessible and more integrated. You know, Microsoft has an AI integration, Salesforce has an AI integration, HubSpot, they all have these AI mm -hmm. integrations. Um, and now, you know, it's like you turn it on, right? So you're very aware of when you're using it. But I, th I mean, my perspective, I think what's gonna happen, this integration is going to become more and more seamless. And it's going to just sort of be there and become part of how we work. And, you know, with its capability to predict behaviors and act on those behaviors, that causes me pause. Mm -hmm. Like, where will we go in the next? It's going so fast. What does five years, 10 years look like? Um, and where do those controls go in place um, and when? Um, to keep it on the rails. <laughs> Spencer? Yeah, I, think, I think those Nigerian Prince emails are about to get really good. <laughs> oh my gosh. Can you believe they're still around? <laughs> and, and, uh, and getting more sophisticated. Yeah. 
yeah. the idea that now AI will generate the video and the voiceover and my concern for my mm -hmm. dad as a consumer who's 85 and yep. has already gotten a call from who he thought was his, you know, my son. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah. checking in on him and, and saying his voice sounded like him, oh but, uh, I, we had the question was asking me and, you know, do you remember me, grandpa? I knew Grady wouldn't say that, but as a consumer, it's, it's frightening. Yeah. Yeah. And this is the worst th these tools will ever be. Why do you say that? They're, they're all in, in the beginning parts of their development, right? The, the rate of expansion, the, the biggest thing that I, I try to keep in perspective is that you know, artificial intelligence is, it's an increase in the one resource that can do anything, which is intelligence, right? Um, electricity was an increase in, in work product. Uh, you know, transportation, uh, air travel was an increase in uh, the resource of speed, but the one resource that can do everything is, is intelligence. Mm -hmm. So when you have that, that sort of explosion happening it's recursive the ai is enabling people to get better at building the, this, these tools which also fall under the, the the purview of ai so the the speed of innovation is going to increase at a rate that i don't think many of us are prepared for at all I, very few people are actually you know you know prepared for what this explosion is going to look like so all of the tools that we have as far as text to video text to um text to image um, all of the multimodal uh, models that are out right now, they're at the lowest state they're going to be in the course of the next four or five years. As long as the lights stay on, their innovation is going to continue to happen. Yeah. And, yeah. I actually want to point directly at as long as the lights stay on, because one of the downsides <laughs> about AI and integrating it too quickly is the Air Canada problem. Some reports mm -hmm. about Air Canada were that they were spending more money on their bot than they were to actually keep their chat or their call center and their their human chat running because they were so excited about it and then it got them in trouble they lost like under a thousand dollars in small claims court and they were like well that's it roll it up like right. you know and yep. so the the speed of integration is is a way that you can have potential difficulties not just for marketing but for anybody because if you put something into production and you pile a lot of money into it and then the company goes out of business or the copyright law comes in that severely changes the way that we handle data or we have a digital privacy law or we have a European law. We have there's just so many variables that are moving less quickly, but out there moving that we I don't know what will exist in five years. It could be everything and it could be nothing like we have we have no map for where this is all going to to play out legislatively and innovatively. I mean, three days ago, ChatGPT went bonkers and started spitting out gibberish tokens. Yes. Yeah. And it said, yeah. it is, it is, it is, it is, it is. That's bad. Like, <laughs> and like part of that is because it, I think that they're working on the very edge of everything. And so when they make any changes, they might break it. Right. So, and if we become too dependent on it and it's not functioning, right. Right. Yeah. Uh, then, then what? Well, yeah. And, uh, you know, big tech is still struggling in a lot of areas, right? Uh, Google's image creating a AI tool has <laughs> got some major issues yeah, uh, right. going on with it right now. So. Yeah, I mean, there's, but again, it's because they're working at the very, very edge. And like we used to do this research like in labs, behind doors, and now we're doing all of the research automatically in public yeah. all the time. Yeah. It's like the worst research project I'd ever want to be on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> mm. So I think, I think the speed of integration. It's good to to experiment with the tools, use walled gardens, figure out ways that your your product and company and service can innovate. Um, but yeah, you've always got to keep your eye on on where uh, where the tools might go and what would happen if they just suddenly disappeared. Yep. Do, do we have uh, a little more time? We do. Oh, thank you. So, um, so one question is, and we talked a little bit about this is. Um, you talked about personalization, and mm -hmm. in some cases, yeah. your 15-year-old thought it was <laughs> going a little bit overboard. But what are some of the cool things that businesses can do to leverage AI to uh, adapt and personalize marketing strategies? Yeah, I mean, there's so many things that mm -hmm. you can do, right? Um, oh, one thing that's interesting, and it's not really a new technology, but really enabling the... Um, in the B2B world, we call them buyers, but consumers, to choose the frequency in which they wish to be communicated mm -hmm. with. 
that puts control in their hands. It also gives us as marketers information on their preferences mm -hmm. and, and what we may put in front of them. But that's a way to give good control on both sides, right? Um, but there's all sorts of really fun, crazy things that are happening with personalization. Um, it used to be just putting their name in an email that was personalized. Mm -hmm. Now it's down to the amount of content they get, the type of content they get, the messages in the content that they're getting. So it's really, and AI is going to play a critical, critical role in being able to create that content quickly and efficiently. Spencer, what about from your perspective? I agree. And I'm speaking to this primarily from an email perspective, but being able to understand more deeply the consumer's consumption cycle, let's say if you're dealing with a large e-commerce retailer, then being able to provide real relevant product support uh, based on their buying habits is, is super important and being able to uh, more accurately segment the data based on their behavior. Like we, we recently were able to draw some conclusions for, for a large client of ours that uh, a completely unrelated, uh, an apparently unrelated segment of data turned out to be one of their highest converting audiences. There was people who are interested in computer hardware, uh, which has nothing to do with our, our product. Uh, turned out to be one of the highest converting audiences. We never would have known that without running analysis. Yeah. So uh, one more question. Yes, of course. So this is the inevitable crystal ball question, right? Mm. Um, if you're looking uh, three to five years into the future, how do you see AI will have transformed digital marketing? Let's start with you, Spencer. I think... Everything that we know about digital marketing today will be much less relevant in five to seven years. I'm one of the people that believes we will have artificial general intelligence within the next five to seven years. And if that's the case, all bets are off. Everything changes. The way we think about work, the way we think about money, the way we think about governments, everything will have to change based on the fact that there is this super intelligence now on the earth. So... And if we simultaneously perfect quantum computing, then mm. all bets are off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Stephen, is that what you were alluding to a few moments ago? Like we just don't know. Uh well, I mean, we we don't know. Yeah. I mean, there's there's a a wide array of futures that are possible at this particular moment, especially because, as I mentioned, we're doing the research right now in real time, right? Like mm. OpenAI has said we're not using we're not making GPT-5 right now because uh, we think that the era of large language models getting bigger and bigger is over. And that was in April of 2023. So like even even OpenAI doesn't know what is coming next, like because they are just tweaking GPT-4 right now and they're probably working on other things, but they're not telling us about them because they're totally experimental. Yeah, so, well, they've had they've had Sora since March of last year. They just felt that the world wasn't ready for it to be released. Yeah. I mean, so they're they're just working on things, and they there there's just so much unknown because everything is being uh, being played out in real time. I think in five to seven years, um, we will have uh, some legislation that is uh, pointing towards privacy. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we'll have a comprehensive privacy federal law. Um, I think there are many people that would like that, and I think there are many people that won't, which is sort of the reason that. It's still unclear who wins that, but I think that there will be some privacy uh, and data uh, rules. I think there will be um, some light guardrails for AI. I don't think the uh, American government is particularly interested in heavy guardrails, although um, there's been a lot of, of layout of principles and policies and voluntary opt-ins and things like this. But So I think there will be some light rules for AI. Um, and what that means for, for digital marketing is that there will be more guardrails and you'll have to work within those guardrails. Um, whatever those guardrails are, uh, we'll be adapting to say, well, we used to do that in 2024, but we're not allowed anymore. But now we can do this over here in 2029. Mm -hmm. So we're going to do this. So I think it's going to be a, a bit of a whack-a-mole <laughs> over the the next five years of, well, we did this and now we can't, and but now we can do this other thing. So, Renee, um, where, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say that um, I think we could have had privacy laws over the last couple of years at the federal level, except for one senator from Washington who chairs the right committee who's prevented it from happening. So mm -hmm. as, as you saw what happened with um, um, uh, all of the military, you know, being stopped from getting their um, 
uh, rank change. Yeah, the ranks. Right. right. One. One, one senator, senator can, or mm -hmm. one legislator can do that. So I have one question for you. Um, ASU is the first university in the United States to have a collaborative relationship That's with right. OpenAI. Are you mm. engaged in that? And is that uh, an exciting opportunity? It is. So it's a very exciting opportunity. We are doing a walled garden where we have our own ecosystem and we're using tools and pieces. Um, I'm actually not a direct part of that project uh, because the project that I was working on um, is uh, precedes was already running before the uh, the project happened, um, and so we've been uh, building a, a chatbot for the uh, the state of Arizona around water issues um, that we'll be releasing to the public, um, and hopefully helping uh, build capacity for public communication through the state of Arizona about these pressing issues. And so um, we've been working on that since August and working with um, uh, ChatGPT API access and doing that sort of thing. So I'm I'm definitely invested as part of the ASU OpenAI ecosystem, even though I'm not in that specific project. Very cool. Yeah. Crystal Ball? I was just going to say, Renee, yeah. we would be remiss if we didn't get to have you <laughs> tell us what's happening next. <laughs> um, and I would just like to direct my comment to all the marketers that are listening out there because it can feel like a scary time right now with so much uncertainty in our our field and what's coming, but I would challenge you to stay on top of it, watch all the changes that are happening, really tap into it and look for opportunities for you because I actually think there's going to be a lot of new interesting job opportunities created from AI um, that have yet to reveal themselves <laughs> and uh, it's yours for the taking. So. That would be my advice. And if you're listening today, you're on your way. That's right. Yes. <laughs> Brownie points for you. You're ahead of the game. Well, thank you, each of you, for being with us today. Again, it's another fascinating conversation and an important one for all of our viewers and our listeners. We also want to thank the Arizona Commerce Authority, who is our uh, tech, AZ TechCast sponsor. And they are also the state's leading economic development organization with a streamlined mission to grow and strengthen Arizona's economy. If you're interested in being a podcast participant or a sponsor for the council's AZ Tech Cast, then please contact marketing at aztechcouncil.org to learn more about the opportunities to further position you as a tech expert, an influencer, or an innovator. And until next time, I'm Karen Nowicki. We sure appreciate your time in listening to AZ TechCast. Thank you for joining us for this episode of AZ TechCast with Arizona Technology Council featuring leading tech and business experts that help influence and shape our great state and the industries they serve.